Welcome to the History Unplugged podcast, the unscripted show that celebrates unsung heroes, myth busts historical lies, and rediscovers the forgotten stories that changed our world. I'm your host, Scott Rank. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our ongoing series on assassination attempts against presidents. What made would-be assassins target presidents, and did presidents themselves target certain types of assassins? Would the type of person that went after FDR be different from the type of person that went after JFK, and in turn be different from the type of person that went after Bill Clinton or Barack Obama? In this episode, we're looking at the targeting of President Bill Clinton in the 1990s. Larry Cockle, head of President Clinton's White House detail from 1998 to 2000, said, We don't want to be perceived as flies on the wall. When sensitive family issues were discussed, and as much as possible, I didn't want to hear. I didn't want to know. I felt awkward being present. So that shows you during the Clinton administration, there are all sorts of dynamics being played out to become tabloid media fodder, and the Secret Service had a front row to everything else going on. So the Secret Service, in addition to protecting the president, also knew more about their personal lives than just about anyone else. Let me give just a brief background of the presidency of Bill Clinton and its characteristics so you can get a sense if assassination attempts were driven by ideology or if it had to do with factors we've discussed in the series, like garden variety mental illness that would make an assassin target anyone who is president, regardless of what their beliefs are, or some other factor. Bill Clinton was 46 years old when he was inaugurated in January 1993. This made him the youngest U.S. president since JFK. Clinton based his candidacy on his promise to follow a different path from traditional Democratic Party ideals. He appealed to the middle class and political moderates and independents, and he promised to promote job growth and reduce the national debt. Once in office, Clinton prioritized law and order, individualism, and welfare reform. But he also left a complicated legacy. He presided over a booming economy, he balanced the budget, and established several new free trade regimes. He also intervened to prevent genocide in Kosovo, and in September 1993, he orchestrated a historic peace treaty between Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat. Clinton was re-elected in 1996, but scandal followed his second term. Clinton lied about having an affair with White House intern Monica Lewinsky, which led to only the second impeachment for perjury and obstruction of justice of an American president in its history. He was cleared of all charges in a U.S. Senate trial, but many Americans believe Clinton damaged the office of the presidency. And others thought that it was just his personal business. Okay, so that's the overview of his presidency. Let's look at assassination attempts themselves. By the time Clinton took office, the Secret Service had begun introducing innovative measures to protect the president. When the president went swimming in the sea, agents were fitted with snorkeling equipment, and when he appeared in public, they'd sometimes dress up as firefighters or rescue workers to offer better protection. When Clinton went on a safari in Africa, they carried weapons that could bring down elephants and rhinos. Clinton appreciated his agents working in a different way that allowed him to avoid the suffocating atmosphere of round-the-clock protection that he thought previous presidents suffered. Clinton said they were really good about trying to be flexible. Sometimes Chelsea, who was his daughter, and I would be walking down in Washington and go to a bookstore or something like that, but I tried to give them enough notice so they could prepare. But some observers believe Clinton's relationship with the Secret Service was less than congenial. Some agents were bothered by Clinton's avoidance of the draft during the Vietnam War, and others didn't like his informal style which involved having to follow what they called Clinton's standard time, a reference to the fact that Clinton was often one or two hours late. Speaking about himself, Clinton acknowledged problems with his protectors when he said, You're impatient because you're tired, and you've got a headache, and you take it out by being a little short with agents. They have to put up with it. And similar to JFK, although most agents didn't condone Clinton's philandering, they believed he was a decent fellow, and had a good attitude toward most people he came in contact with. Many of the problems agents encountered were not caused by Clinton, some agents believed, but by the president's staff, who some called were difficult and arrogant. According to some accounts that have been published, 
Agents held particular contempt for Bill's wife, Hillary. One agent said she had an explosive temper and constantly belittled everyone. She's very angry and sarcastic, and it's very hard on her staff. She yells at them and complains. Another said, she didn't speak to us. We spent years with her. She never said thank you. This view was also held by many members of the permanent White House staff who characterized the Clintons as haughty and arrogant. One account said that Hillary Clinton allegedly hated the Secret Service. She once ordered the agents to stay the F back, stay the F away from me. Don't come within 10 yards of me or else. On another occasion, she chided an agent who refused to carry her luggage. If you want to remain on this detail, get over here and grab those bags, she shouted at them. She also ordered agents never to speak to her if she was walking through the White House grounds. When agents reminded her that keeping a distance of 10 yards made it difficult for her detail to protect her, one account said she didn't seem to care what the Secret Service said. Her response was simply, just do what I say, okay? During a trip to Little Rock, she left her agent standing as she got in her car and drove away and stayed away for several hours. Some of the detail thought that the First Lady had placed her life in jeopardy. So accounts like these that detail the inner life of a president have come up a lot more frequently, especially in the last three or four administrations. And as you can imagine, critics of these accounts will say that they're partisan hit jobs, whereas supporters will say that they're throwing the curtain back and showing us the real picture of this president. Well, the Secret Service was virtually omnipresent during the Clinton presidency. Except for the upstairs family quarters of the White House, agents were always present except when Clinton met with close advisors, and even then an agent would be posted on the patio just outside the Oval Office's glass panel doors. Agents were present when Clinton walked his dog Buddy on the South Lawn and when he went swimming in the White House pool. As Clinton observed, the Secret Service is the front seat of the car when the president is riding with people talking about anything from national security to sensitive political matters to personal family matters. It was because of their close proximity to the president that Kenneth Starr, an independent prosecutor appointed by Congress to look into allegations of corruption and the Whitewater scandal, wanted to subpoena some agents in Clinton's White House detail. He also asked them to appear as witnesses in his investigation into whether Clinton obstructed justice in the Paula Jones sexual harassment case. Jones had accused the president of making improper sexual advances toward her when he was governor of Arkansas. Effectively, Clinton admitted guilt. Her lawsuit was later settled. When Starr subpoenaed several agents, including the head of Clinton's detail, Larry Cockle, to question them about the alleged romantic affair with Monica Lewinsky, the agency objected. We, internally in the agency, didn't want to be perceived as flies on the wall, Cockle said. When sensitive family issues were discussed, as much as possible, I didn't want to hear it. I didn't want to know. I felt awkward being present, but I know my presence was compelled by law. The Secret Service felt very strongly that agents should not have been summoned to testify before the grand jury investigating the Jones incident. The issue was argued all the way to the Supreme Court, which ruled that the Secret Service was not immune to subpoena power. Cockle and the other agents were compelled to testify. It was one of the few times in history that the agency was forced to break the unwritten rule of confidentiality. Like JFK, Clinton's womanizing caused problems with the Secret Service throughout his presidency. Agents were concerned about the way the president compromised their protective mission by frequently leaving the White House unescorted. According to FBI liaison Gary Aldrich, a sensitive White House source said Clinton would leave late at night through the West Executive Lobby exit in such a way it would appear he was walking to the Executive Office building. Once Clinton was out of sight, he would be driven by his aide, Bruce Lindsley, covered up by a blanket on the back seat of the car to the Marriott Hotel, where he'd meet up with one of his mistresses. The Secret Service apparently knew about the trips and kept a log of the president's movements. Aldrich characterized Clinton's behavior is one of the most serious and irresponsible breaches of security in U.S. history. During Clinton's first seven years in office, the Secret Service made arrangements for 2,500 appearances in more than 800 cities in the United States and abroad, as well as 450 appearances at public events in the Washington area. During this period, the Secret Service Research Division 
maintain a list of several thousand Americans who were considered presidential threats. More than 400 were on the watch list of dangerous individuals. Several hundred weapons were detected each year, almost all of them carried lawfully by people who had state permits. Those who were discovered to be carrying weapons illegally were usually taken to police headquarters and charged with a misdemeanor. There were a number of incidents that the media characterized as threats or unconnected to any assassination attempt. Three incidents in particular received a lot of attention. In the early morning of September 12, 1994, a Cessna 150L airplane crashed onto the south lawn of the White House, killing the pilot, 38-year-old Frank Eugene Quarter, but injuring no one else. The plane came to a halt against the south wall of the White House, causing minimal damage. President Clinton and his family were not at home at the time. The Clintons were spending the night across Pennsylvania Avenue at Blair House while White House workers repaired faulty ductwork. There was no evidence Quarter, who had been drinking and smoking crack cocaine at the time he flew the plane, ever intended to kill Clinton or had been angry with his policies. Rather, according to Inform Associates, he simply wanted to die crashing his plane into the White House. Another incident involved 33-year-old Marcelino Corneal, a gang member with a violent criminal record. Five days before Christmas 1994, Corneal, who'd been living in Lafayette Park across from the White House, ran toward uniformed White House police with a hunting knife taped to his hand. Two park police officers and two Secret Service agents confronted him, their pistols drawn. After Corneal ignored repeated orders to drop his weapon, one of the U.S. Park Police officers shot and killed Corneal. He had made no overt threats to kill President Clinton. In another incident, on May 23, 1995, Leland William Majetsky, an out-of-work pizza delivery man who had once studied for a doctorate in psychology, scaled the White House fence and was shot in the arm by a Secret Service agent. Another agent who grappled with Majetsky suffered an arm wound from the same bullet. Majeski was carrying an unloaded 38 caliber revolver, and the Secret Service concluded that he had no intention of harming Clinton. Instead, agents believed Majeski wanted to be shot by a police officer. Clinton was the subject of numerous written and verbal threats to his life, some serious and some not so serious. Among the non-serious threats was the case of Rob Sherrick. On Christmas Eve 1996, Sherrick preached from the pulpit of the Washington National Cathedral, saying, God will hold you to account, Mr. President, referring to the president's veto on a ban on partial birth abortions. After the service, Sherrick was detained by Secret Service agents who accused him of threatening the president's life. No charges were forthcoming. Michael Shields was a 28-year-old gun dealer and president of Firearms International of Norfolk, Virginia. He was an avid student of war, and sometimes donated military memorabilia to his alma mater, Virginia Wesleyan College. Shields hated President Clinton, and when he questioned in 1993, <coughs> and when he was questioned in 1993 by agents from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives about an unrelated gun case, he told them he wanted to kill the president. Shields assured agents he was serious about the threat, and he was recruiting accomplices. Secret Service agent Glenn Garbus said he made the threat over and over again. Shields was arrested at the Norfolk Federal Building. In June 1993, Shields pleaded guilty to threatening President Clinton and was placed on probation for five years and sentenced to eight months' imprisonment. Under an agreement with prosecutors, he received credit for four months he spent undergoing psychiatric evaluation and another four months for time he spent between a halfway house and home detention. The Secret Service considered the case of Paul F. Walling and Zolt Sass to be considerably more dangerous. 46-year-old Walling, who lived in Berwyn, a suburb of Philadelphia, was an unemployed auto mechanic and gun enthusiast who had stockpiled 40 guns and hundreds of rounds of ammunition. Neighbors described him as a gun nut and heard him talking incessantly about weapons. Local gun dealers described him as a regular customer. Walling also had a temper. When he was angry, he sometimes threatened to shoot his neighbors. In July 1994, Walling told a friend he was livid about the Brady Handgun Control Act and that he would like to shoot Clinton and Attorney General Janet Reno for what they have done to the American people by trying to take guns away from them. The friend happened to be a police officer who told the secret. 